Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here, and it's time for the live stream. Geo Carcinus, Nezogaster, and Angelo Di Marzio all in the house. Nice to see you here. Welcome. Uh, as you can see, I've got a copy of my new book, Oren McMonagall's Isopod Zoology. Very, very cool book. And thank you, Jordan, for this book. Um, I, you know, I can't show you too much because it is... It's a book and it's intended to be sold. So uh, I'm gonna be judicious and just show you a little bit of what's going on in the book, but it's got some very cool things. Anything, for, it talks about mites. It talks about uh, different cultivars of isopods and how to care for them. It's got all kinds of interesting things. Sorry, the camera is in not exactly the right position. Let me move it a little bit. There we go. Um, just has so much about different types of isopods uh, even some of the newer ones in the hobby this is the newest version of the book so we have cubaris in here and different things like that so it's pretty awesome and once again thanks to jordan for this book i'm so excited about it i just finished reading it uh yesterday the day before it's been it's been awesome newt scamander hello abel plant hello welcome jordan Kermit Hermit Crab, Spicy Beans, and Chara. So welcome everyone. Glad to have you all here. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of other cool things. I'm going to take a second just to have everybody say hi to Rufus before I put him back. To Doodles. Well, that's a cool name. I like it. I'm glad this is a... You're able to get on the stream for the first time. That's very cool. So I was just handling Rufus before the live stream and still handling him, of course. I'm going to put him back so that it's easier for me to show you some other things. But I just thought maybe you'd like to say hi to Rufus, as Newt just did, and Chara just did, and Spicy Beans. There's Walnut, Walnut, Anderson, hello, Thoropods, greetings. Yeah, okay, here we go, Rufus. Go ahead and I'm going to put him in his enclosure. Come here, come back and show you some other cool stuff. There he goes. All the garter snakes are excited because it's feeding day. They seem to uh, sense that. Um, let's see, Aquatic Ma, also in the house. Nice. Thoropods. You have the same book with you right now. Awesome. And To Doodle, Two Lake Chapala Garters. Oh, those are awesome. Are those the ones with the, uh, like the kind of greenish look to them? Is that the one? And Walnut, Parthenogenic Cresty. Yeah, we actually have two of them. Well, this is what happened. Uh, two of them hatched, and the original one we kept, and you may know that his eyes, uh, well, one of his eyes didn't develop very well, and so he's basically one-eyed now. Um, and, but otherwise doing fine. The other one, my daughter's friend actually adopted it. It was a, it's a younger one that never really got, you know, it never really got full grown. It's already, what is it? I can't remember if it's two or three years old now. It really got to full size, but its eyes, even though they were slightly off, one of them was slightly smaller than the other. It's pretty much normal, uh, certainly functional. And uh, since we're here and she knows that she can always um, refer to us if she needs help with it because she lives close by and whatnot, she ended up adopting it. And uh, so, yeah. And it's doing well, too. And hello, Angelo. Robert Gear, cool. So, Newt's Commander, now that I've had blue death fainting beetles for a few days, they remind me of tiny nocturnal insect tortoises. You know, I've said the same thing my wife, or maybe she's the other breed. It, they, they really are like that. They have the same sort of look to them in the way they move and stuff. So where can you buy the book? Well, this should be available on Amazon. In fact, I was going to put a link in the description to this video, and I didn't do it just in case anybody wanted to do it. But if you look this up on Amazon, it should be there. And so Newt, they dig a lot more. Yeah, they, they dig quite a bit. Leanne's Critter Corner, hello. And Nezogaster. Ah, well, he, he does have a lot of cool books. He, he does. And um, he may be the most prolific invertebrate author that I know of, he probably is. Um, let's see. Geocarcinus, how are the porcelia? Oh, you're doing great. Let me grab 
Um, I lost one shortly after getting them. They sent an extra, which was good. Uh, lost one. But as far as I know, I mean, they're, they're all doing really well. And you can see there's a monka right there near that part of the exo that shed there. The monka running around. They're, so they're breeding. And they started breeding earlier than any of my giant Spanish porcelio did in terms of from when I purchased them. Like my Hoffman's Ega, I didn't have baby Hoffman's Ega for a long time. Didn't have baby Magnificus for a long time. My Ornatus were faster than the other two. But these had monkey like really fast. So I was really excited about that. Let me see what I can do with the audio. Okay, I'm going to experiment a little bit with the audio. Just a second. Okay. Audio, please let me know. I want to know if that improved anything. Um, trying to make sure that it's working. Okay, I unplugged my mic, took out the extension, and plugged it back in. So how is that? In, any better? Um, let's see. Malone, can you give us some information about the care of Pugaris, Pugaris species Panda King, please? No, I have not kept that species, but I can show you what my... Cubaris uh, Red Tigers, how their setup is, and maybe that will help. Um, okay. Let's see. And Jordan, congratulations on your zebra monkey. That's awesome. Glad to hear they're doing well. This is a six quart tub for now because it's a small colony. I just started out with 11 of them. And so they're just in a six quart tub, but I'll be moving them later. Okay, good. I'm glad the audio is doing better. Thank you, everyone. To doodles, Pied Porcelio Levis Orange. That is awesome. That is so awesome. That's like one of the holy grails going on, as far as I'm concerned. Ah, now I've lost my extension, my mic extension. I have others. I need to go dig one up, but it, not at this point. Okay, glad the audio is. Do you have any video of your Porcelio Levis orange to doodles? That would be so cool. So Aquatic Ma, can you tell me what the common species of isopods are down in Florida? I'm looking to start a colony to eventually use for bioactive Pac-Man frog habitat. Um, there's several out there um, in Florida. There are kind of a lot. A few off the top of my head. They do have Trichorina tomentosa. They have Nagurus cristatus, the um, dwarf striped isopod. They have Porcelionides prunosus and Porcelionides Floria, and uh, those, some of those could be, I think something like the the um, dwarf whites, the Trichorian and Tomentosa could be a good one to go with Pac-Man frogs because they breed fast, tend to stay in the substrate where the frog's not going to see them as much, and uh, the temperatures would be good, the humidity would be good for them, and less likely to eat them. With something like a Porcelia onides prenosis, probably be more interested in eating them. So I don't know if the Panda King is difficult. Let me show you what I got here with my, um, these are my, this is my new culture of uh, Cubaris Red Tiger. And I would imagine the care would be similar to Panda King. This is a new colony, like I said, but it's breeding. I've got Monkai in here. I don't see any under this particular piece of bark, but I see one in the corner over here, just ducked into the substrate. Let's see if we've got any more. There's another adult there. And I think some of these adults are actually adults that were produced in this colony. I'm not entirely sure about that. I don't remember exactly how many I got, but it seems to be doing really well, both sides. And then I've got a little ventilation hole cut in the top. I've got the drier side over here with the leaves, some pieces of bark, and then the, the moss that always stays damp. So um, I would try a similar thing with Panda King, unless there's somebody else who has, you know, more um, specific care because I haven't cared for them before. Um, so let's see. Pied Porcelia Levis orange so rare. Um, well, I think the mutation, as far as I know, is just not spread around the hobby yet. And basically, if you... Dairy cows are Pied Porcelia Levis. And people have been trying to cross them, myself included, so that we could get the, the orange version. But we don't... Uh, it hadn't happened yet. They're not crossing. They don't seem to cross. And we do get 
some that have kind of an orange tinge to the white with the dark markings, but we don't have any that are white with orange markings. And because the orange tinged white with dark markings is a different genetic thing going on entirely as the, cra the cross that uh, like I've been trying to produce. So um, it's just it's not in existence yet, except it sounds like Tadoodles has got them now. So that's awesome. So zero cool. Huzzah. Uh, let's see. So walnut, what do you suppose is a good isopod species for Crestes besides the Porcelione days? I've actually been experimenting with uh, Porcelio Levis, dairy cow. They're doing really well with one of my Crestes. Um, Silisticus convexus is one I have with another one of my Crestes, and that seems to be going well. So, yeah. So, to doodles, I got to talk to you. If you're in the United States and I can get some from you at some point, I would love to play with that uh, morph. We could do some trading or something like that when you're ready, if you want to. Um, all right. Oh, and Jordan, I'm glad this is at the perfect time. I wish I could do it in the middle of the day every day, kind of, but I don't get to do that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Geocarcinus keeps Panda King. Cool. Yeah, that, that should help. So thank you for offering that. That makes sense. And Leon's Critter Corner. Greetings. Oh, I'm glad you're joining us from South Africa. That's awesome. Um, I'm not quite sure which species you have there. I'm pretty sure you probably have Armadillidium vulgari and things like Porcelio scaber, but... Um, so, Eve Williams. Been out of, some of my species on my list can't ship to Florida because of my permits. Um, Florida restricts... Florida, Louisiana, and Oregon restrict things that get shipped. So, they accepted some of the isopods on my permit, but others they didn't. Right now, I'm, my Florida shipping is kind of on hold because I have to send them all a specimen of each one that I want to send them so they can confirm the identity. So I can't actually ship anything to Florida right now until I've done that. And I'm currently waiting on them to tell me whether or not I need to spend, send a specimen of each morph of each species or just each morph. So Kermit, I actually don't have experience with glass frogs. They look cool, but that's all I know. So let's see, Porcelio Skeber lottery mix are breeding too fast. Um, can I slow them down some? You can. Um, I don't know if that would be good for them to slow them down by reducing the leaf litter you provide, but that would probably slow them down some. Uh, and it wouldn't stop them completely as long as you're feeding them decent food. So it's kind of uh, hard to say. What, what could you do to slow them down? Hmm. I feel, always feel like if I'm slowing them down, it's kind of because there's a husbandry issue. Is That's the problem with that is... Um, if I'm slowing them down, I'm, I'm kind of cramping their style, so to speak. So, as far as taking care of the, uh, yeah, the red tigers is, and Geocarcinus is saying that caring for the red tiger and the panda king are almost the same. So, yeah, basically, just like I said here, um, just make sure this stays moist all the time. You can keep this a little drier, but keeping this moist, some moisture will move over here. But just don't, this is more damp over here with the moss. Keep the, the leaf litter, you know, I, I just topped off the leaf litter, like probably today or yesterday. And then make sure they have bark to rest under. And seems super easy uh, as far as this goes. Much easier than, than uh, the dairy cows, not the dairy cows, dairy cows are super easy. Than the uh, rubber duckies have been for me so far. Much, much easier. Okay, so... I Bugman found a dark pulp or armadillo's ice pod. What species? Now you're local. You're in the same state that I am. So what you might have is Armadillidium vulgare uh, with uh, iridovirus, which is actually eventually lethal. You probably don't want to keep any of those because they possibly might infect your colony. Um, so that is so cool to doodles. So it sounds like a applied like the koi mutation in Porcelia scaber rather than like the dairy cow mutation, but that doesn't matter. It's super cool. Well, so you are in the UK, but that's still cool. They're getting into the hobby. Maybe someday they'll, they'll make their way over, but it's too bad we can't actually ship very easily that way. Um, and Lance H., you're welcome. And I, I'm really, uh, really glad to hear that. And E. Williams, yes. I understand it's important, but it definitely is a bother. I agree with you. Um, that is so cool to doodles. 
One that's split orange and white on each side bilaterally. That would be fun if you could get that working. And Newt, yes, we can get an update on the captive born and bred blue death painting beetle. I have it right here. I figured people might want to see that. So I'm going to pull it out right now and you're going to take a look. See how it's doing. I'm, I've been enjoying watching its progress. I'm so grateful that it survived. That was, that was a blessing for sure. So, and okay, I'm going to show you right here. Check it out. Look how it's developing the blue coloration of the adult. Slowly, but surely. Like there's very little on the body, but on the just terminal tip of the abdomen there, there's some. And on all of the legs, there's some. So it's doing its thing. It's obviously doing really well. It's eating, it's doing what it should be doing. So I'm really excited. So Lancelot, 1977. Hello from Germany. Awesome. And glad to know you're enjoying the videos. So you have P. Scaber orange and P. Levis wild type. Awesome. So Nezogaster. Well, that's a good question. Why this beetle is so dark? Well, it may not be that the young are actually dark, but this is the one that ended up being dipped in you know, it took a dip in water. It got into the humidity well from the enclosure. Um, oh, and thank you, Leanne's Critter Corner, for joining. I really appreciate it, and see you next time. So I did breed blue death fainting beetles successfully. This is my first individual that metamorphosed, that, you know, it, it started as an egg from my adults, my wild-caught adults, and I raised it as a larva up to a pupa, it pupated and metamorphosed into an adult, did the whole thing in uh, my care. So I'm pretty excited about it. It's an awesome thing. I actually did a recent video on it, on the whole process. I actually have a whole playlist on the process. It goes from when I first set up the enclosure um, through the different steps of the process, putting the larvae in the uh, incubator, all that stuff. So it's pretty fun. Um, all right. So, yeah, and Newt, that's to go back to that idea of changing color. It took a dip in the water and that changes its color. Whenever they get wet, they change to a black color. So I don't actually know if this beetle would have been, you know, already the powdery blue color of an adult by this time or not, uh, if it had been, if it hadn't took, taken a dip in the water. So no way of knowing that at this point until the next one hatches. But since the humidity is high in the incubator, I have my suspicions that any newly emerged beetle is going to be kind of dark because the humidity itself is enough to make them dark. It doesn't actually have to be immersed in water. But I didn't know how long it would take to develop the color or whatever, but it looks like it's happening, just taking it a time. I mean, even the, the body color is a little bit more blue than it was. So, yeah. And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to be able to uh, breed them in captivity a lot more, and uh, that a lot more of the, the blue death fading beetles in captivity will be captive born and bred like this one. And they really are a gentle beetle. I've never been nibbled on by this beetle. I've been nibbled on by other beetles before, but not this one at all. They're very uh, kind of relaxed. This one has a good appetite. It's been eating mostly pre-killed crickets and beetle jelly, and some carrot, some zucchini, that kind of stuff, what I've been putting in there. And it really goes to town. I mean, I think it's already eaten four entire crickets itself. Yeah, it finished off that last one I gave it. And you can see there's a little beetle jelly in there from what it ate before. And I don't even see the carrot. Wow, must have eaten that carrot too. Got a good appetite for this little guy, which is nice. So thank you, Newt, for bringing that up. I think that was great because I kind of wanted to talk about it anyway. Uh, let's see. So, to doodles, are you any active in any online isopod groups like on Facebook or Reddit? I am part of the captive, is it called captive isopoda? I think that's what it's called. One of the isopod groups, or maybe two of them, on Facebook. But I'm not really active on Facebook per se. I mean, I get on there once in a while, but uh, and I've posted things on there. But Facebook, I just don't have a very good relationship with Facebook. I don't get on it very often, and uh, I, I need to do that uh, once in a while, I guess. So welcome back, young lad. Jordan Savala, have you, have you ever used reef carbon in your ice pod bins? Reef carbon, no. Um, act, not activated, um, what do I want to say? Lump charcoal, yes. But activated carbon, no, I have not done that. Um, I could see some benefits from doing that, but I have not done it. Um, 
and Jordan also. Oh, hello Dave, Jordan's friend. Nice to have you here on the stream. And Kermit the Hermit Crab. I am currently working on breeding uh, the Cottonwood Stag Beetle. Uh, last month, uh, it was on the 4th of July, in fact, I collected four adults, two males and two females. And I think the females have already laid eggs. So yeah, I guess I'm in the process of breeding them, if it ends up working. Um, unfortunately, my males died. That's not uncommon. They, they tend to die uh, shortly after they reach maturity and breed the females. And then uh, they show up in June and around, I mean, start showing up in June around here. Their main month is July and then by August they're dying off, a lot of them. So the males have died already, but at least one of the females is still alive and they're doing their thing. So I bug men, where should I buy my blue death feigning beetles? Would it be better to catch them wild? Well, uh, you can get blue death feigning beetles. You can find them wild here in Utah. I know you're local, uh, but usually just down south, like in Washington County. I found one on my trip down there uh, that Washington County is basically the northeastern border of the uh, Mojave Desert. So you can find them there. I haven't found them in any other parts of the state. Oh, I've heard rumors about finding them in other parts of the state. Um, you can you could do it either way. I mean, Bugs in Cyberspace often has them. Um, Zeric Bayou has them. I think to doodles it's captive isopod. I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've been on it. And Nezogaster heard that coconut fiber makes a bad substrate. Is that true? Well, I would say it's not the best substrate. Bad substrate, I wouldn't say it's a bad substrate, but I would also say it's not the best. I've used it. It was the, the only substrate I've used for, well, not the only substrate. I mean, it was the base of my substrate for a while, for a, a year or two. I, that's basically what I used as my base substrate. And then of course I included the, the leaf litter. But um, I would say, so it's not necessarily bad. You can totally do it. You can get hundreds of baby isopods and so on, as long as you're providing leaf litter and rotting wood and so on. It's not bad, but it does have some issues. Sometimes it will get too acidic if it gets too wet and it's just not as nutritious. So once I switched to other substrates, my isopods were breeding better. Let's put it that way. So not bad, but not great. Um, let's see. So Andrew, hello. Are dairy cows known for burrowing? Um, they are one of, they, they do burrow. We're not gonna say they don't burrow, but they are one of the isopods that burrows less. In other words, you're gonna find them running around in the daytime up above the substrate a lot more than a lot of other isopods. I do see them burrow, but not nearly as much as some of the others. And they're really, really surface active. Oh, and Newt Scamander, you got your blue death painting beetles from Bugs in Cyberspace. Awesome. That is the place to do it. That is a really good place to do it. That's where I've got most of mine, too. Although I didn't get this one from Bugs in Cyberspace because I bred it. And I've got a couple of my others from other sources, but uh, most of them came from Bugs in Cyberspace. And Peter is always great to work with. Sorry about the airplane flying by. Um, Peter has always been a joy to work with. Very, very knowledgeable, very, very helpful, and has got great bugs. So Kermit the Hermit Crab. Cocoa fibers only really good combined with other substrates. Yes, I agree. XX Callum Ray, hello. Yes, with millipedes, I think, uh, because they get so much of their nutrition from the substrate that uh, cocoa fiber, just plain cocoa fiber, is really not good for most millipedes. So I would like to show you something else. As soon as this airplane goes by, I'll be able to talk about it better. But let's just take a close look at these little monkai. I am so excited that these guys are finally producing monkai. It was uh, when I got my first armadillidium gestrate, when I got these adults and the other adults that are in here, they were about as small as all these little monkai were. Uh, and so it took a while. It was back in October. It took a while for them to get to adulthood. They actually get pretty big before they start reproducing. A lot of isopods will reproduce at one third of the adult size, and armadillidium gestroi don't seem to do that quite as readily. They're, they're more like half. I mean, none of these are full, full adult size. They get big. I have one in here that's pretty big already. Uh, well, a couple in here that are pretty big already, but they get bigger than this by a long shot. But this is already a lot bigger than any of my other armadillidium species that I have. Um, there aren't very many armadillidium species that often get 
as large and as wide as Armadillidium gestor. I'm not going to say none, there are some. And, and like I said, these are not fully grown yet by any means. But actually, Nazatum is supposed to get really big, but it doesn't get that big very often. But Gestroy consistently gets big. I know Granulatum, Officinalis, they get really big. So there are some others too. So I want to show you something before I go any further, okay? Just let me move this out of the way. This is from Isopoda Pet. Check this out. I love it. Look how beautiful this is. This is a Cubaris species red edge. It's called a Dangomushi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that exactly right, but check it out. I mean, this is, it's got these antennae. It's got the proper number of legs. You can even see, um, you can see the pleopods indicating this is actually a male. It's anatomically correct enough that uh, it, it is visible as a male. You can look here and you can see the uropods. I mean, the pleon and the perion, everything is doing its thing. This patterning for a Cubaris species red edge is really pretty close to the real one. You can see the ocelli, um, the compound ocelli. I mean, it's really, really cool. And then it's got this little notch and this little knob so you can... Oh, I, I left the legs out. You can put the legs back in and it'll lock up and roll up, which I think is great. And this is from Isopoda Pet. And one more I want to show you before we move on. This is also from Isopoda Pet. It's a beetle. And it's not as anatomically correct as the isopod is. The isopod is pretty close. This is less so. But it's still very cool. And it even has little antennae. And it's got, um, you know, elytrae and everything that look really cool. Little beetle that will vulvate or roll up into a ball as well. It reminds me of a blue death fanny beetle and anatomically it's not quite there, but it still reminds me of one and I think it's awesome. So I love these. Um, so I spot a pet, that's where I got them. So to doodles, a tentative deal with an exotics place to sell the pied when I have them established better. So maybe they get the US one day. Probably, I hope so. That sounds super awesome. I'm, I'm glad that that worked out for you. I just, yeah, that's, that's super cool. And let's see. Thanks for joining in, Bugman. So XX Callum Ray, a vulgario albino, lost almost half your culture. I think, yeah, we did talk about that. We talked a little bit about humidity, uh, humidity, temperature, humidity gradient and ventilation are the first things that I think of. Have you had any temperature swings? Okay. And yeah, with something like this, you probably would need to feed it pumpkins. And yes, they do have other species in color variants. This was the one that I chose. I've actually seen that they do a zebra one and they do armadillidium klugai and they didn't have any of those at the time, but those are two that I'd really want to get. I love those. So again, I'm just going to put this guy down, let him walk around a little bit with his beetle buddy while I look at the... Yes, and sorry about the, the jet in the background. I live close to an Air Force base and, um, you know, I very much support what they're doing for our country, but it does get loud sometimes. The, uh, and they do flybys all the time often when I'm filming videos. You would not believe how many times I'm filming a video uh, for you guys, uh, like a not a live video, and I have to stop and cut out a section because of the uh, audio, is uh, that. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yeah, so these are, are uh, like fighter jets. I don't remember which model they are, but it happens a lot. So, Let's see. I wanted to show you guys a couple more things here. I'm going to move my Dangomushi beetle and isopod here. Just wanted to give a little look to the Porcelia Levis milk back and see how they're doing. This colony has just taken off for me. I love, there's a perfect example of a milk back. I mean, several of them here are just perfect examples where you get the pale 
coloration right down the middle of the back and then the dark all the way around it. And then you get some that look a lot more like dairy cows and some that are just kind of low expression like the one in the middle uh, of the shot right now doesn't really have much coloration at all. It might color up a bit more when it gets uh, older, but anyway. Very cool, very prolific, and of course the springtails are going nuts in there as well, which is great. Um, if we look at the mossy side over here, there's a lot in the mossy side too. Just the colony's been doing really, really well. These I got back in, these were February is when I got this colony, and I think there were about 20-ish uh, young isopods in it, and it's, it's done really well. I really like them. They seem to be just about like dairy cows in terms of behavior and um, fertility and all that kind of stuff. Care, all that. And I agree to do those. There's not enough cool isopod merch out there. It's coming, but we need more. And maybe a video on that would be cool. It's a good idea. So Kermit, have I ever kept pill millipedes? Oh, look at this. This is why you have to make sure that the sides of the container are either wiped very clearly or that you have a very secure lid because there's a little dirt right here and it's enough for the isopods to climb. Now if I wipe that off, probably not going to be able to do that anymore. But there's enough on the sides that they were crawling up. So you have to be careful about that. Sometimes you won't notice that it's happened until it's too late. So I'm moving things around so that doesn't happen. Have you ever kept pill millipedes? I have not. Uh, I have kept and do keep various millipedes, but pill millipedes don't occur in my area. And I would have to get them shipped to me, but I don't have a permit to get them shipped to me. And the large pill millipedes, the really big ones, like the tropical ones, seem to do very poorly in captivity, most of them. And the really small ones, some of them do breed pretty well in captivity and do okay, like the glomeris. Some of those will do all right. Someday I hope to be able to keep some of those, but I need to get a permit for those. And thank you, young lad, for joining in. No. Yeah. Some of yours ride the snails up to the top of the lid to doodles. That's awesome. Oh, okay. I got another dirty corner and I got isopods climbing up it, so I'm wiping that down. Okay, there we go. Um okay, Newt, try this. Um it's isopoda pet rather than isopod pet. So isopoda space pet, I think is the it was on their Instagram account. And I don't know if they posted it on their website or not, but I got it from the Instagram. That's where I found it. And Freaky for Strange, can you persuade my mom to get a millipede? Hmm, I can try. Um, they're super easy pets. They're super low maintenance. So if you want something that's easy and you can leave on vacation for a week uh, and not worry about it, a millipede is one of the best options. And Killcast. Hey, welcome. Thank you for joining in. I'm going to go for a little, little while longer on, I have, I think I have enough time I can go a little, a little longer on the stream today. And millipedes really are amazing, super, super easy. A lot of people find them cute too, even people who aren't necessarily bug people find them really cute. So I think it's a pretty good option. Okay. Oh, look at these guys climbing up the sides because it's dirty. I just need to get a paper towel and wipe it down. But I'm going to close this up so I don't lose any more. Well, I haven't lost any, but I don't want to lose any. Um, milkbacks. Nope, losing my beetle. I'm going to close the beetle up. See how this works? It's, it's really cool. Like I said, not very anatomically correct, this one, but still very cool. And I believe these legs just fold down here and the antennae fold down here. Just scoot them back like that. And then it just kind of rolls up like that. Cool little beetle. And catching up here on the te on the the chat. Cool. And thank you, Edison. They are gateway invertebrates. Why not? Excellent. Welcome. Holly C, hello. Oh Jordan, thank you for the super chat. I would love a like spike. That's awesome. We've got 39. What can we get to? Oh, we got 41. That's fast. It's coming along. Um, I think I want to show you, let's see. I can reach my Punta Canas from here without uh, going too far with my microphone. So should we look at the Punta Canas? They're cool. 
they really make me want to get some gem mix because I love the way that they have so much variety in the culture, but gem mix are even more variety, so I would love that. But see, they're really starting to take off for me. They're, they're, they're doing well. So I really appreciate that, Jordan. We got 49, so that was, a, that was a decent like spike. I am pleased. And I really appreciate the super chat, Jordan. So Andrew, you didn't see those. Check their Instagram account and uh, message them and see if they still have any. They may not, because I ordered them about a week and a half ago, a week ago, or something like that. Okay. Okay, so why not? You've had a couple different types of millipedes. That's awesome. 13 out of 15 on my easiest pet list that only I use because I'm not a YouTuber, unfortunately. Well, that's cool. I think they are they are highly rated. I, I would agree with you. So, XX Callum, Ray, Dairy Cows, Powder Oranges, a Vulgari Albino, and Tropical Grays. Let's see. What would I suggest if you've already got those? I'm, I'm looking at my collection here and seeing what uh, I might suggest. So, hmm. So you don't have any Porcelio Scaber, huh? Maybe a Porcelio Scaber Lottery Mix or one of the Calicos would be the way to go. And uh, maybe some giant Porcelio, like uh, Porcelio Ornatus, like uh, maybe a high yellow Ornatus. That could be a good one to start with because they're fairly easy. Um, that could be a good way to go. Let's see. Your first invert table really surprised how much everyone wanted to know about the roly polies. Arthur Pot Ambassadors. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Are you, ha does, are you getting some lag to doodles? I'm going to put these guys back and see what else I can reach. But look at those guys. Very cool. So I like them a lot, and Gem Mix is now on my list probably because of these guys. So uh, let's see. It's a little hard to reach because I don't have my um, don't have my extension. Don't have my extension, but so I can't reach without unplugging my microphone. But see, this is what I mean by the lottery mix. This is there are many lottery mixes out there. That one doesn't have a ton under it. There you go. See, I've got I can see a calico. I can see a dalmatian. Maybe a ghost. Uh, I've got oranges in here. I've got orange dalmatians in here. Um, Kind of a fun. They need some more leaves, don't they? There's an orange, and there's kind of a lot of color going on in there. So I like the lottery mix. There's an orange Dalmatian. Oh, it just ran away. And there's like a, a dirty Dalmatian. Let me get a couple of those in here. I think there are actually some calico Dalmatians in here as well. I don't have any of the like lava or anything in this particular lottery mix because this colony is started from the. Uh, my orange Dalmatian project when I decided to start breeding orange Dalmatians. These were the results and then I've thrown some other Porcelio Scaber uh, individuals in here from various enclosures. So, let's see. Yeah, Nizogaster, I agree. One of the things is that some of them are pretty easy to catch in the wild without damage, as long as you're careful, without damage to the uh, wild populations. I do have Porcelli Magnificus. Let me see if I can grab those. I'm going to have to unplug my mic for a second. Well, unplug's not the word. I just have to detach myself from the mic uh, to get into my Porcelio Magnificus, cult Magnificus culture. Um, here we Let's take a look. Porcelli Magnificus. Um... I only see one on this piece of wood, but there it is. It looks like probably a, a young female there. And let's see if there's some more on this piece of wood. I, I bet that we're going to find. Oh, there's a lot more here on this piece of wood. There is a male right there. Not quite full size, not even close to full size really, but definitely a male. You can tell by the uropods. Most of the rest of these, I think this is a young male here. These are females. That one's kind of hard to tell at this angle. But yeah. And there's a monka. There's a tiny little monka right here. A couple of, well, just one. 
one little tiny monk. I've, I noticed that there were some in here recently. So they're breeding again. Um, what I had before, kind of sad, um, I had a different lid on this enclosure. And they were breeding for me like crazy. I mean, they were doing really, really well. Let me just show you the enclosure a little bit. Um, they were breeding and producing lots of monkai. And then one day I looked, I was somewhere in my critter room here and I saw one crawling on the floor and I was like, what happened? Why is there a Porcellium Magnificus on my floor? And I looked at the lid and I realized that the screen had come loose from the tape and opened up a little gap where they were crawling out. They had, some of them had been escaping. So I changed the lid. I don't think that's going to happen anymore with my new, my new uh, enclosure set up, but I did lose some just to escaping, which is awful. And now this lid, I don't think anybody's going to get out of this. It has plenty of ventilation, but it's better than my older lid that I had on there. So yeah, that uh, seems to have solved that problem. But now I'm waiting for my population to rebuild. So there you go. Um, let's see, you know, I'm jumping back. Cody, hello. Killcast is setting up an enclosure for local Armadillidium vulgari. Ah, it's going to be your first invertebrate. That is awesome. It's a good way to go. So, Craig, hopefully this satisfies, you know, the, your question a little bit. My giant isopods, like these guys, are doing well. I could pull out my uh, titans and my ornatus. I might as well pull those out. We can take a peek now that the uh, Porcelia magnificus are kind of running away a little bit. So I'm going to put those down like that. Sorry, I'm trying to get the, uh, the cork bark to actually fit. There, that's much better. You don't want the cork bark bumping up against the lid and making sure, you know, making it so it can't close properly. That's not good news. Okay, let me see if I can reach my Hoffman's A guy, my Titans. I can. Sweet, without even unplugging my microphone. I didn't know I could do that, but I can. So that's, that's a good deal. Sorry, things are getting crowded over here on the table, but we're going to check it out. Hmm. Uh, okay, so let's see what we got in here. None under that piece of bark, which means most of them are going to be under here. Check them out. These are my, my Titans. And they're doing well, as you can see. I've got quite a lot of them breeding. Um, let's see. So, Gaetan, are cherry tree leaves good for isopods? I am not sure. I have avoided them because I've heard about toxicity issues with cherry. But I am not sure if that's an issue with dry cherry leaves for isopods or not. But I avoid them. So. Okay, so yeah. Porcelio Scaber are a good, good one to begin with then. Um, and Andrew, your giant canyons are producing? They're actually pretty decent growers. Um, it'll be probably at least three months, maybe eh, probably longer than three months before they start being, uh, you know, reproductive, probably uh, maybe close to six months or so, depending on temperature and how much they get food wise and stuff. It'll be a while. Okay. So Addison, is there a reason P. Levis are not shippable to Oregon or they're regulated now for the, for purposes of my permit, I am not permitted to ship Porcelia Levis to Oregon because in their records, they don't exist there. They're not already established there. That may or may not be true, but uh, they are not shippable in under the conditions of my permit. That, you know, I'm only talking about my specific permit that I have. There may be other people who are able to do things like that, but uh, yeah, that's, that's my understanding. There are a few more species that I can't ship to Oregon as well, or to Florida or to Louisiana. And I think Hawaii, I can't ship anything. And then I think the other ones, I can ship the selected species that are on my permit, which isn't everything. Um, so that's cool. That's about how, where it is. Oh, you found a cricket in your snake tank today. You know, I found zebra isopods in my snake enclosures the other day. I guess it's been a while. Um, okay, anonymous toucan in the house. Awesome. And yeah, arthropod ambassadors, it only works when they have dirt on their enclosure or something like that usually. Hello, David J. So Cody, wondering if superworm beetles would do okay with mealworm beetles or if they would just end up fighting or out competing one another. My 
best guess is that they would end up out competing one another. Not sure which one would win. But I do culture both of those, superworms and mealworms, but I do them separately. Uh, okay, so freaky for strange. One small enclosure. Well, if that's all you got, that's what you got. It's, it's uh, still cool and still fun. So I'm going to put these guys back and get something else out. I've got my... Titans are always fun. But I'm, I'm going to pull out my Ornatus. Ornatus are fun too. These are Porcelli Ornatus Yellow Dot. These came from Wally, Supreme Gecko. He sent me these a while back. And they're doing well. So, let's see. So, Nezogaster heard keeping ice pods with millipedes can be bad for molting millipedes because they're vulnerable during and after molting. Is that true? Can be. Um, it's not always a problem, but it can be. And I think it seems to be the worst problem, like according to Oren McMonagall, when there's a slight bit of damage to the millipede during molting. And it might other have otherwise even survived a little bit of damage, but the ice pods will kind of sense that and they'll, they'll go after them if they're damaged. If they're not damaged, they don't tend to. Is I think the, uh, kind of the upshot there, but because damage can sometimes occur, can be a little risky. And Anonymous Toucan, totally understand. When you can, you can. When you can't, you can't. I get it. But I really appreciate your support. And Freaky for Strange, unfortunately, I can't ship out of the U.S. I can only ship to... Um, It is. Uh huh. Okay, so I should uh, leave soon to pick it up in just a second. Okay, great. Uh huh. Okay, so tell me that one more time. The, the south door. South of the main entrance. Still, still on the east side. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, guys, um, I have to leave to go pick up my wife in about five minutes, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna crank through here and a few more, and then we'll, uh, I'll, I'll take off. So, Moombas, do you have Asortidum? I do have Armadillidium vulgaria punticana, which was originally designated as Asortidum, but they discovered it's not Asortidum, so. There may be a sortedum that's separate from that, but I don't have that. But I do have, they were labeled as sortedum when I bought them. And anonymous toucan, your first larva turned into a beetle. Which species? That's awesome. Blue tongue skinks, I think they're awesome. If I were going to get another lizard, I have, we have three species of gecko right now. But if I were going to get another lizard, that would be a high on my list of lizards to get. I think they're a lot of personality and a reasonably moderately sized package, I guess. And an ice dexter, an isopod colony is self-limiting to some extent, depends partly on the species, but it's, it's resource based. I mean, if you are offering a certain amount of food and so on, they, they, there's some regulation that goes on there. And Jackie, hello. Thanks for joining us from Washington. And Okay, thanks Jay's Crazy Obsessions for coming in. And Freaky for Strange, I hope you have giant colonies too. And you're welcome, Nezogaster. Um, and okay, Anonymous Toucan, awesome. Well, normal mealworms are still beetles, still awesome. G glad it's working for you. And thank you, Jordan. I really appreciate your super chat. And I'll I will enjoy the rest of the day. Hope you do too. See you soon. So Newt Scamander, three species. Um, I can't remember what I what I'm saying, what I said about that. Can you remind me what we're talking about? So zero cool. Beetle jelly, beetle juice. Ah, that works. Plated lizards. I've read a little bit about them, but I don't know a lot about those. And Tarantula Collective. Awesome. Thanks for joining in. Oh, and you just left a super chat. That is awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Learned a lot about keeping isopods from watching your video. So I'm glad you love the channel. I really appreciate the support. And Tarantula Collective, do you mind if I make a little bit of an announcement here, like a teaser? I would love to do that if that's okay. 
Um, and you're welcome, Zero Cool, Holly C. And David J, congrats on the baby dairy cows and scavers. And, oh, three species of gecko. Yes, three species. I keep morning geckos, um, crested geckos, and we have one leopard gecko. So, theropod hunter. Would aquatic ice pods need brackish water? Depends on the species. Some would. I have kept freshwater species. I've kept entirely marine species. I've never kept brackish species, but there are brackish species uh, that uh, do need brackish water. Yes. Okay. So, thanks again for the Super Chat Tarantula Collective. And I just wanted to announce that next month we're going to be doing a collaboration video. It's going to be a Q&A session on tarantulas. I can't keep tarantulas. Uh, my wife, you know, has, she's asked that I not do that. But uh, I, there are a lot of people who ask about tarantulas on our channel and I would love to do a Q&A. And it just so happens that Tarantula Collective is willing to do that. Kind of got connected a little bit through uh, Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace. And we're going we're gonna to do that. So I'm excited about it. And uh, so keep, keep uh, that in mind. Uh, if you have tarantula questions you'd like to ask for that, keep those in mind for next month. A lot of people were really excited when we did the live Velvet Ant live stream. So we're going to do the same thing about tarantulas with the Tarantula Collective. Um, so it will be really cool. I'm glad to see that many of you are excited about that. So I think this is about time to go. I've got to go pick up my wife. But I really appreciate everybody joining in. Uh, thanks for making a great stream. Thanks for the super chats to Jordan Safala and to the Tarantula Collective. Really looking forward to our collaboration, Tarantula Collective. And everybody have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be excellent.